Uh, you know, I, I think that people have an immediate reaction like, oh, how can you do a film about books? Um, that must be really hard. But then there's such beauty in the printed word, uh, which I'm sure that you probably found as you were making the film. Um, you know, just an opening remark, and maybe you could react to it. Yeah, you know, um, so Dan is also, along with being a producer, and he's, he's also a director of the film, he's a also a rare book dealer, a very accomplished rare book dealer. So um, the film originated from an idea. It was really, really his idea in the very beginning, mm -hmm. many years ago. Um, and one thing that he really advocated from the beginning that we were, Judith and I were, of course, completely sold on as well, um, mm -hmm. was just that there was a very rich visual potential for the film mm -hmm. because he's so familiar with the range of material. Yeah. Um, and he just, I think, saw that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we came on board with that, too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to I mean, there you got them. There's so many documentaries about art and photography, for yeah. example, because yeah. it's, it's so obviously cinematic. Mm -hmm. You can show it. People can see it. And if you look at book fairs now, they've changed in the sense they're not just rows of books, but this was mentioned in the film. They're, they're on display. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know if your displays have changed over the years, but um, it's a very visual mm -hmm. world, the yes. world of books. Yeah. They have, haven't they, Nancy? Uh, yeah, the great okay. backdrops. You know, you yeah. put all the leather-bound um, books with all the, you know, gem colors and all the gold um, yeah. etch edgings on them. I mean, they're just they're beautiful. Yeah, we have display cases with explanations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like if we were to um, have this at the Antiquarian Book Fair, like everybody here is now a book collector, and we we all want to go out and buy things. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy is going to want to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> But and and really, what the film becomes at a certain point is a portrait of different people's relationships to to books, to what they love. Um, and was that the way that you started, or did you just want to make a film that dealt with you know the world of booksellers? I think we talked more about kind of the collecting obsession originally, yes, and how yeah. fundamental that was to sort of the order of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to see that, you know, a lot of dealers also um, share that. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, I th not all, though. So there are definitely dealers who don't have the collecting obsession. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's a way to kind of exercise it without building collection, but just you still get to sort of tap into it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I think that grew a little more as, as we progressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think... Uh, from the very beginning, the, uh, there was the idea that we would not highlight a single dealer, that this was going to be yes. a real cross-section um, in terms of generationally a little bit, but also mm -hmm. kinds of material being handled. Um, so just to give s and this is by no means, this is definitely not an exhaustive, you know, uh, accounting of the trade. Uh, we could have easily put 30 more dealers. How could you do, do that? Right, no, you <laughs> could, no, obviously. So, yeah. But um, I think that idea of, as, as that idea that it would always be a cross section mm -hmm. was there, but then as we talked to more and more people, that that kind of the degree of relationship I think became more mm -hmm. uh, a component of the film. And uh, just before we open up to the audience for questions, I just want to ask everyone to, uh, you know, the, the, the obviously you get to this question at the end of the film, one side articulated by Glenn Horowitz. You know, I mean, it's like this is the end, this is it. You know, it's it's the apocalypse, it's over, goodbye. And then for Fran Lebowitz, of all people, you know, who is just like uh, to say, you know, every time I see people reading books on the subway, it's young people in their 20s, and that's a really the, the most hopeful thing you'll see on the subway, as Fran says. But, you know, um, um, I, you know I, I, I would tend to be on Fran's side of that. Um, I think, um, and I'll ask these guys, but yeah. I think s it's, it's kind of like everything's mm -hmm. – under this cloud of uncertainty a little bit. Sure. So I think the way that different people are manifesting all these different opinions yeah. um, is interesting because it, there's clearly no path yeah. forward that we're sure. sure. And I think there's an anxiety a little bit in the book trade about that. Yeah. Um, I but that's the only thing there's anxiety about right now. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's the Fortu only Fortunately for yeah, More anxiety than I yeah. need. Yeah, right. no, it's um, which is great. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, you know, there's there are statistics that are, you know, give us room for optimism that millennials read are reading more I think than previous generations at the same age, but then I think you know that generation still didn't grow up entirely on screens yeah. and stuff. So then there's, I think, a reason for some pessimism about 
has become more cyborgified kind of mm -hmm. with our phones and technology of how that will impact our reading habits. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys think about that's a sort of never ending question. Well, I, I don't think it's hit the books the way it has, say, the music industry. I mean, the, the alternative to a book mm -hmm. just didn't catch on, I think, quite the way they were expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are obviously lots of Kindles around, but there's yeah. a tactile quality in a book mm -hmm. that you don't get from, you know, whatever it's called, just like a moving your fingers to turn the page. Right, right. We're seeing a real enthusiasm with um, with young yeah. people coming, especially for the nostalgia. I mean, yeah. it, it kind of hits them. And, and look at the music industry. I mean, look at the enthusiasm for vinyl records that young yeah. people have. Yeah, that's So I, I think there's going to be a real insurgence of it. And, you know, people, um, you know, with these devices, they're feeling not connected with humans and, and mm -hmm. stories. And we're noticing, you know, the... The people uh, love reading more and more books. They're coming in for events. There's, there's still the shopping experience that, that they want. Yeah. I mean, the internet has changed collecting. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also yeah. There's this. There's research that shows that actually, you feel more empathy when you read on print versus on the screen. Yeah. Um, you feel more connection. So, that's just something to consider when we look at our future with everybody getting all their information and reading on screen so much. Like what that means. Um, yeah. It's, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah. And there was a really, I think, very pertinent op-ed in the Times just a few days ago about, and I kind of wish it had come out when we were making the movie, but um, about how authoritarian regimes in China, oh Erdogan yeah. in Turkey, um, are where they are now seeing printed books as being more threatening yes. to their regimes than the Internet because they've been able to essentially use the Internet for propaganda and right. control to such a degree mm -hmm that they are, they're more concerned about the ability of books yeah. to escape detection, to escape surveillance, and to convey information yeah. outside of a surveillance state, essentially. It's totally yeah. private activity that you can do. Yeah, I also know that as a preservation, you know, in the world of film, uh, the, the, the point that's brought up in the film about, you know, go back and try to open your files from seven years ago and good luck with that. And I mean, you know, the world is just, uh, the, you know, in film, the preservation medium is still film itself. So I think it's very similar. Yeah. Um, questions? Yes. Wait, here's a microphone right next to you. Here it is. Oh. Where do you go to uh, uh, to get your books valued? I mean, how do you know if 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 I have some rare copies of some really good books? Who would be the first one to use to make me an offer? Do you have them on you? Well, you have two people down at the end who could definitely <laughs> talk to you about that. I, I hesitate to name names here. I'll, well I'll hear audience. it from, from the some of the others. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, you have you have many resources. You know, in most of the bookshops you go into, you'll, you'll have someone who, who can assist you. And and as a couple of the booksellers bemoaned in the film, there's now the internet where you have information right in front of you on the page. And you can, with that information, often get values, you know, from from mm -hmm. digging around. So, and you'll see that it there's a big range there. It's not not everyone with the same price, but it's also not everyone with the same copy of the book. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think though you have to be careful with the internet because sometimes yeah. people will just put um, prices sky high. They'll just think if that's the one copy there, I'll put it at ten thousand dollars and yeah. just see like who is that desperate for a book. It doesn't mean that you can come in and sell a book and really get that, that price for it. it, it doesn't mean that that's really the value of the book, too. Yeah, because sometimes people will say, um, uh, this book is selling for $10,000. And I said, I have to correct them. I said, no, this book is being offered for $10,000. Yeah. <laughs> it's been offered for $10,000 for the last 10 years, <laughs> and <laughs> it's never, ever going to sell. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of it valuation has to do with condition. You, you know, like like they talked about in the film, the dust jacket. You know, it has to be an important book really for it to be collected, and there has to be a demand for it. Mm -hmm. What is the book? Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, did you, do you have the books on you? Did you bring them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right there. Uh, here's a microphone. One thing I always wonder about with people who collect books, and I have books that I love, is are they actually ever reading the books? Because there's so much talk about the beauty mm. and the story, but do you find when people that you interviewed for this film or in general, do people, uh, it, unless it's a book that's falling apart, are people reading the books or just valuing it as an object? 
I'll pass that down because you guys know better. But um, I question. would say, I think generally no, but I think, <laughs> but <laughs> I think the idea that you can, in my sort of my take on it, that if it's your, uh, it's something you treasure, that you can go look at it and read passages or parts of it, is very compelling. Um, but I got into this. Uh, my father was a doctor, but was a book collector on the side, and uh, there was a piece done on him once where he, he bragged about having read um, Hamlet from the first folio. Um, and th for him, there was a, a kick to actually, it wasn't his copy, it was a copy that an institution had, but they, they allowed him in there, and I guess they, I guess he was in there for a while, because it's a long play. It's a long but, play, um, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's, there is, there are many book collectors who do read the books they have, and there are others that, that never look at them, but just to have the objects mm. it means everything to them. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's some, I think a lot of collectors, they, they love that author, and they've already read the book, and that's why they want the first edition. I mean, we also sell, uh, you know, uh, libraries of people just with kind of gold bindings, and, and I doubt they are able to have the time to read all of that. Mm. Yes. Uh, wh here's the microphone. Yes. Wouldn't it be for collectors that just, <coughs> excuse me, the knowledge of what is in that book or what could possibly be in that book of value? They have no clue what it is, but they do know that what lies between those pages is of great value, usually. And that's part of the joy and the thrill of collecting and obtaining that book as an object? Sure, I think so. I think um, also kind of maybe related to that is if it's a book that was owned or, you know, it's a manuscript mm -hmm. or it's, you know, something that's in an archive where it was previously possessed by that person, like if it's the author's personal copy of something and you have that, you have a piece of that author's personal history, and that can be, I think, a profound thing. Mm. Yeah. I noticed in it, with most of the dealers that nobody was wearing gloves, um, and they just sort of handled <laughs> these books with their bare skin, and you don't see that at museums or anywhere else, so I just wanted to know if maybe you know why nobody wears gloves when they handle these books. I'll pass it to Dan because, again, <laughs> they know more. But <laughs> my, my friend Stephen Massey started laughing because he's been having this question asked for years and years. If you, if you go to an auction um, and you're previewing the sale, uh, you, you won't see the dealers or the, um, uh, the specialists there using gloves in almost every case. And actually, the, the primary reason is that the tactile feel of turning the pages, it's easier with the, with the finger when you put gloves on. Um, but we, we do get asked that a lot. Um. I, I think there's a, a casualness, too, because you just deal with rare books all day long, that it doesn't seem um, maybe as, I mean, I, I think, you know, the object is elevated, but you're, you, you handle so many. Is that so seem true? Uh, Here. Yeah. You, you answered it in the right. movie with your father pricing the books yeah. and Heather. Heather mentioned it too. In so the, in she'll the be here Sunday. But what is terrifying <laughs> that I experienced um, was, uh, I think it was Terry Osborne at Reason Company showed me at the book fair um, a, a map, a very old map, worth I think 300 something thousand dollars. And she, you know, she opened it up to show us, and this is a very fragile old map. Worth and you know, if, if it rips in half, there goes the $300,000 basically. And I mean, I felt like if I sneezed, Boom. So when Fran's joking about, you know, I have to, it's like a, a Henry Short story, like I definitely shared the sentiment in that moment. And everybody actually is rock, walking around with red wine at this book fair, which is crazy. We can't believe that it's allowed, but <laughs> did, did you As notice how many, how many people spinach. had cats there? <laughs> well, <there's a laughs> Both people love cats. There were no dogs in your film. Yeah. Well, there's a thank you to the cats at the end of the, at the end of the end credits, right? I think not all the cats yeah. made the cut, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Sadly, we have to clear out for the next uh, for the next show. But this has been great. What a movie! Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank everyone, you everyone, for coming. Thank you.